All right, here we go. Today we have legendary boxing trainer, Teddy Atlas. Welcome to Vlad TV. Uh, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. It's a nice studio you got here. You're not in it, but I, I can take my word for it. It's nice. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> well, you have a very interesting story, but I want to start at the very beginning. So you grew up in Staten Island. Yes, sir. I did. I sat okay. on New York, uh, one of the five boroughs. It used to be greener than it is now, but it's still, it's still the greener of the five boroughs. I believe it is anyway, but not quite as green as it used to be. Okay, and your dad's a doctor. Yes, my father was a doctor and a builder. We grew up on uh, Grimes Hill, which overlooked the, where the bridge wound up being built, the Verrazano. It was a nice area. Was, we were very... Um, fortunate that we had a good father who worked hard um, because he came from a very, very poor background. And um, so we were, we were fortunate to grow up in a nice place. Okay. But even though you grew up in this nice area with a doctor father, you started getting into a lot of trouble when you were a kid. We, we lived in a place in Grimes Hill where obviously, as it suggests, it was a hill. And down the hill was a neighborhood that was a tough neighborhood. It had projects. It was Stapleton. And most people would like to get up the hill. And I wanted to get down the hill. And I did. I wound up, and, and maybe in some ways figuratively too, in life, because um, although I should hold off on that because I went down the hill where there was a different life and and a, I guess a lesser life than was supposedly on top of the hill um, and more problems in, in that life. But I I went to it myself. I wasn't pulled to it. I, I pulled myself towards it. Well, you dropped out of school your senior year and then in Stapleton, like you just mentioned, there was a, a situation with a knife. Yeah, it took a minute to get there, but if we're going to jump and catapult to there, which obviously I understand, um, it didn't, you know, I didn't go down to Stapleton and then a knife showed up and um, stabbed me in the face. Uh, obviously, I was hanging out there for years. I had a, friendships, like I said, and um, I was in a, look, I'm not even going to say I was in the wrong place at the wrong time because from a physical standpoint, obviously I was. I was down there, I was with a friend, Billy, uh, that I, he was older than me and he grew up in the projects and as I said, we, we became close and he was driving a car and uh, we got cut off and we cut them off back, and then they cut us off back and all that, you know, stupid stuff. Got out of the car, started fighting. And, um, you know, I'm not gonna make myself uh, Captain America and say, hey, I was doing this and doing that, but I was, okay. <laughs> I was doing what you're supposed to do. I was hitting people that were coming at me <laughs> in those kind of circumstances. But I still remember one of them went into his pocket. And, you know, even under that chaos, you know, you know, you know what that is. You know what that means. Obviously, it's, he's, you know, he's not coming out of there with like a handkerchief to rub his nose. And um, when he came out with the knife, you know, the it's a funny thing, not that there's anything funny in this story, but I recognize the knife. Like, things do slow down sometimes. And I recognize the knife because on the corner where we're hanging out, back in those days, there was, there was a cheap knife called a 007. And uh, a lot of guys used to carry it. And I never carried a knife. I didn't have a knife on me. But I remember friends of mine they would show me how to flick it. They were all into flicking it open. That was the thing about the 007. If you learned with the wrist and you got the right wrist action, you could flick it right open. Not a switchblade. You had to do it yourself manually. So it was kind of like a thing, you know? 
and you think you're cool, whatever, and you, you flick the knife. So I actually remember when I saw it, hey, that's a 007. And, uh, you know, I, what did I start this conversation with? Choices. You, you have a choice. What are you going to do? You know, you're going to try to get out of there or you're going to do something else. And um, and again, I'm not Captain America. But like, oh, I'm brave. I stayed there. First of all, it wasn't brave. It was instinctive. I'm not going to give myself credit. It was just like my instinct, my thought, my choice at that time was, if I get to, if I say here, yeah, he's going to obviously stab me. If I get to him, I could get to him maybe before he does this, the you know, the flick. So I did. We were only good at flicking it open. This guy was good at flicking it and coming right down with one move. So he came down with the knife and he cut me. Obviously, we know that. And... um You know, that was, that was that situation up to that point. Well, you got 400 stitches from that cut? Yeah, 200 inside, 200 out. You know, that's what they did. It's like surgery. I remember telling the cop, just call Dr. Atlas. Everything, don't worry about it. <laughs> I, you know, I, I just call Dr. Atlas. Like, and they were telling me, don't talk. You know, and my father was a well-known doctor, so... I remember the cops actually acknowledging, we know your father, and, um, but we don't have time. And we get there, and they, were, they came out, you know, they came out to meet the stretcher, the doctors, and they pulled me in, and then I remember seeing lights, you know, obviously, you know, the, the surgical lights. And again, I was calm, and I, I remember the last thing I said before, the, obviously they put me out, I, I didn't mean to insult the guy that was going to put 400 stitches in my freaking face, but I said to him, get Dr. Atlas. He's, he's, the, he, he's, uh, he'll take care of it. He's, I, I don't know if I said he's better, but he's, I hope I didn't say he's better. I wouldn't have gotten too good a job, but I said, he's, he's the best. And the, the doctor, he said, your father is great, is a great doctor. We just, and he kind of said what I guess the cop said. He said, we just don't have time, but we're going to take care of you. And then that was it. I was asleep. And the rest, you know, was being done to me while I didn't realize. Did you, I mean, this is a horrific injury and a lifetime injury, essentially. Did you ever find out who did it? Did you ever try to find out? Did you yeah, ever? Yeah, I never, it's a, funny you asked that because, um, yeah, it was somebody that, uh, Turns out I lived in the projects, and uh, you know, I never talked about this, really. And you know what? I don't know. What's the matter? I found out it was a guy named Charlie Wilson. <laughs> I don't give a freak. And um, it's 400 years ago, but whatever. And turned out that he had... Um, they... They, I don't know if they grabbed him connected to this. I guess they did. But he had shot a kid. He had been out on, he had been out on, I don't know if it was bail or he had maybe, you know, was a uh, previous sentence because I don't want to say things that I'm not 100% accurate. I just know that he had shot a kid and um, the kid lived, but he had shot a kid. So he, he wasn't a, it wasn't a guy you'd be, you know, looking to go to dinner with, and, and I guess, and all that. And he, um, you know, he he wound up not doing any time for this. But I didn't pursue that from a legal standpoint, to be frank about it. What I did pursue was trying to find them, and. Um, Again, I avoided this, but um, some some friends that were able to figure out where he was, 
one night, and um, he was in an apartment. And we were gonna, well, we were gonna go there. And I don't think I need to tell you what we were going there for. And um, it turned out at the last second that we realized there were kids in the apartment. So we called it off. Okay, well, that situation happened. And then you were involved in an armed robbery. I guess what happened was the only people that got my father's attention were the people that were sick, the people that were messed up, the people that were fractured, the people that had problems. And all of a sudden I went on a journey to become one of those people. I, again, not in any way consciously saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I just started doing things that were selfish. I started doing things that got his attention. And quite frankly, I did things that hurt him. And um, part of those things was what you just alluded to. I, I'm running around like an idiot, doing things, and I figured the only way I'm gonna, you know, not knowing that. And what made me dangerous, I realized this. I was around a lot of people that were dangerous. This, obviously, this guy Wilson was pretty dangerous, but in my own way, I can't plead. I can't plead innocent to be in danger. I was more dangerous in some ways than these kids that had nothing to lose, that that were angry. They didn't even know why they were angry. I'm running around thinking I, I'm doing something in a righteous way. I actually thought, you know, again, I didn't put it in my head and articulate it that way, but I actually thought. This will get me to where I got to get to. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's okay. I could get into fights. I could go and do it because whatever. It's getting me to where I want to get to, to him. And I robbed a freaking, I was with older guys. And um, we robbed, you know. When you say robbery, my God, I, I, it wasn't like I was John Dillinger. I wasn't. I was the stupidest, lowest bar of robberies you could be. I, I, I don't know if they rate robberies, but if they did, I, I wouldn't even get rated. We went into a freaking Hess gas station, and back then they had cylinders. I don't know if I was uh, one of the reasons why they never had cylinders no more, but they had these cylinders, these concrete cylinders, and they stuffed the money in there. And on a Friday, Saturday night, they get full. So we were getting gas, me and my friend, and um, I just started, I, it's full. So I started pulling bills out. And then I took a comb, and with the comb, you can pull more bills out. And <laughs> I thought, hey, they're giving money away over here. Wow, this is pretty cool. You get gas, you get money, you know, you, you do what the freak you want. And, and I'm pulling bills out, you know? And then the attendant uh, finally caught on. And where it became a robbery it was, <laughs> yeah, robbery. Four 20s and three singles and, and two fives. I don't even know what it was, but obviously what came after that was what was even worse. Not that any of it's good because you should never violate anybody that way uh, and do something like that and make a kid like that feel that way. And he started to come after me, the kid. So I went after him and then he went back into the, you know, into the, to the gas station area. And when we were pulling out, um, basically, he started coming after us again. We had a gun. And I put the gun out the window and uh, put it in the air and shot it. It got reported that I shot at him. You know what? At the end of the day, it don't matter. I shot a gun. And... Um, I was arrested for armed robbery and I went to Rikers Island, you know, and um, 
hey, you, <laughs> I was an idiot. And um, I'm, you know, you're thankful afterwards that thank God, thank God you didn't hurt nobody, you know. And, but again, you're left with those choices. And the thing that I was left with was, I thought I was doing what I wanted at the time to get my father's attention. And, um, but then when you finally get out of that selfish place, you finally realize the damage you did to, you know, and this, the harm that you did. You think you're just harming yourself, like I said earlier, but that that is a, you know, that's not accurate. I mean, that's just an that's just an excuse for yourself <laughs> to to get off the hook, because at the end of the day, you're hurting a lot more than yourself. Okay, so you get out of Rikers, and you had a friend named Kevin Rooney. And Kevin was working with Customato up in the Catskills. And he invited you to join him. I had I had to go to trial. And I grew up with Kevin. And I boxed in a PAL with Kevin. And Kevin had gone up, Kevin had just, it was 1975. Kevin had just, he had just won the New York Gold Gloves, which was one of the biggest tournaments in the country. And boxing tournaments, amateur. And he got an opportunity to have a chance to possibly turn pro and go train under, you know, a legendary guy named Custom Auto. And he got helped out by some great people, the writers that were friends of his, uh, Dennis Hamill, John, John Hamill, Brian Hamill, Pete Hamill, great, great writers. And they were, they were friendly with Cus. So, they arranged for Kevin to go up to Catskill, and it was four months before this happened. So he was up in Catskill training, amateur, but, you know, training, hoping to be a pro. And basically, Cuz was a legendary figure. Had two world champions, Jose Toys, light heavyweight champ, and Floyd Patterson, heavyweight champ, youngest heavyweight champ of all time. I got out on bail, and I was facing, you know, what I should be facing for what I did, right? And it was, I was facing like, whatever, 10 years. And because of the way I was living my life, which wasn't good, and getting into fights, you know, a lot I was doing, a lot of street fighting, and just, again, just being a mess, Kevin said, look, I want to get you up. I'm going to talk to Cus and see if I can get you up here while you're waiting your trial. Because if you stay down there, your life would have get in trouble again. And Cus started looking into my case. He knew about me from Kevin. He okayed me going up there. And he started looking into my case. Cus comes from the Bronx, Brooklyn Boulevard, tough area. Cus was a big guy on not your physical talent, but your talent inside as far as character. And he felt, which I was kind of shocked that I had some character because I didn't think I had much character the things I was doing. And I didn't, quite frankly. But he looked at it that I didn't, I didn't turn evidence, you know, I didn't, the street term, become a rat, whatever. And he said there's strength in that. And we could build around that. So... Cuz got to like me a lot. Okay, so you're up in the Catskills working with Customato, and then right around 1980, a 12-year-old who's 190 pounds, all muscle, named Mike Tyson shows up. Yeah, he... Uh, I was training fighters. I started the Catskill Boxing Club. We had a real club now. There were fighters there. It went from nobody, I, I, went, I brought in 10 kids, 20, 30, 40, 50. We had a real, real gym. 
and we were winning tournaments. I was taking kids out to fight in the amateurs, taking them down to the Bronx to get f smokers, fights down there, get more experience because this fighter had a gym down there, his former fighter, Nelson Cuevas. And we developed, uh, we developed some. Cuz would only come to the gym maybe once a week just to see what was going on. And, and give me what I needed. Uh, just a boost. I wasn't making money, so he had to give me a boost. And he'd say, look at this. Teddy Atlas is making champions. So that was all I needed. And then one day we get a call from this guy, Matt Baranski, who ran a Trinity gym up in Albany. He knew Cuz. And he said, Bobby Stewart, who used to be his fighter, he's a correction officer in a in a prison up there, actually a juvenile detention center outside Albany named Tryon. And he's got a kid up there named Mike Tyson who he does, you know, he's he's incorrigible, except he listens to Bobby now because Bobby started teaching him to box a little bit. And Bobby would like you and Teddy to take a look at him. So Cuz told him, bring him down. So he brought him down in the prison van. That was the protocol. He brought him down and uh, we took a look at him. He was very raw, but he was 190 pounds, 12 years old. First thing I thought, where's the birth certificate, right? I mean, how could you not think that? But he's 12 years old and he, he don't know nothing. But he's strong. He's 12 years old. He's 190 pounds. So you can't look at the bag, hit the bag. He could go knock the bag off the chain. That wouldn't mean nothing to me. So I got to see him box. And cause, of course, the same. So I didn't have anyone that size. So Bobby Stewart, who at the time was 27 years old, 27, 28, I think 27. He was a former national champion in the amateurs and a former pro of, I think, 14 fights. But he was only 175 pounds. But it don't matter. He's 28 years old, 27 years old, and a former pro. He could move around with him, you know, and, and you know, not hurt him and move around. We could get an idea because you can't get an idea hitting the back. You got to find out what's not outside but what's inside. And the only way you get an x-ray of that is to get in the ring. And with somebody that can test your nose, test your will, test your spirit, not just your, your skill. So they get in there, they box. And like I said, very raw, but he had things you can't teach, quickness, power. You know, me and Cus always said, punches, and I would always say it on ESPN over the years, punches are born, they're not, they're not made. And it's true. He was born with power. And you could see this. But you could also see that he was a kid from Brownsville. He didn't have anything. He'd been arrested 30 times already. There was, there was nothing to go back to. And you could recognize there was an urgency. You could recognize that there was an innate intelligence and awareness with him that he was on audition for his life. He didn't know for sure where it could take him, but you know what? Wherever it was going, it was better than where he'd been. So he instinctively knew how he had to behave. He had to behave like a tough, hungry fighter even if he didn't feel that way. And I also knew immediately, because I run the gym, and I understand, Cuz was right, I was made to be a teacher, where you gotta be the boss, you gotta be in charge, I'm in charge. Years later when I'm a pro trainer, people say, Teddy Atlas is a dictator. Guilty? Yeah, if that's what you call a guy who's in charge, and that doesn't make deals, that doesn't let you be in charge. You came to me for a reason. If I can't be in charge, I can't do the job. Yeah, I'm not making deals with you. 
The deal is for me to teach you and for you to learn, not to find ways around that. So I knew what I had to do. And I, I had a feel what was going to happen. So after two rounds, we saw what we had to see. Strong as hell, quick, quick twitch, you know, ability. And Bobby had to actually fight a little bit to hold him in his place. That's enough. And he got a bloody nose, Tyson. Here's the, the telling thing. After that, we would, I know, normally would never put a guy in a ring without teaching. It's not responsible. But this was responsible. We had to find out if we were going to get involved. Once we found out, I knew I wouldn't put him in the ring for another five months, four months, six months, until he learned the things he had to learn on the floor. Until it made sense. After we... Just fast forward for two seconds. After we took him and started making him into a fighter, he never had a bloody nose again. What does that tell you? It, yeah, he was he was this raw piece of clay. Yeah, he was strong. Yeah, he was fair. But he had to be taught. He still had to be taught. And after two rounds, I saw enough. It wouldn't be responsible to make him go anymore. So I saw enough. Cuz knew it. Cuz is sitting in a chair. I, it's my call. I jump. All right, that's it. Get out. Tyson says, no, I'm not getting out. What do you mean you're not getting out? I'm not getting out. I want to do another round. No, you're getting freaking out. And you're getting out right now. Because I had to send a message that I knew what was going to happen. I knew we were going to train this guy. You didn't have to be Notre Dame to figure that one out. Uh, 12 years old, 190 pounds, Cuz wants another heavyweight champ. And he's looking at this. Yeah, okay, you didn't have to be the Mason Kreskin. We're going to take him. But I got to show him that there's going to be rules here and, and there's going to be one person in charge. No, you're getting out. Finally, he gets out. Cuz says to me afterwards, what do you think? What did you think? He's like testing me. What do you think when he said he wanted to go? You think that was real? I said, no. Cuz says, tell me what you thought. I said, he was telling us what he needed to tell us to get us to think we were seeing what we wanted to see. That he was already behaving like a fighter, that he had that urgency, that he had that desire, he had that toughness. He didn't want to go, but it doesn't matter. And Cuz said, why does it not matter if he really wasn't feeling that way, if that wasn't real? I said, because he was ready to do it. That's what matters. Yeah, he didn't feel like it. Yeah, he didn't really want to take any more punches. He shouldn't. That's not normal to want to. But he knew that he might have to in order for us to get involved. So he was ready to do it. That's all that matters. He can make himself do it. Cuz said, you're right. And then Cuz said something that's just, to this day, is, is extraordinary. He said, well... Get ready to start training in first heavyweight champ. And I'm like, you know, I don't take it serious. Like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Meanwhile, I'm already training pro fighters during the day. Amateurs all night. I'm in the gym seven days a week. And, uh, and now he's going to tell me that this 12-year-old kid's going to be my first heavyweight champ. But... I guess he knew something. <laughs> I guess he knew a little something about what the hell he does for a living. But at the end of the day, that was... He, he had to finish about four months in Tryon, but we started the process to, you know, to have him live with us when he got released and for him to become a... He was a ward of the state, and they, they had to start the process for him to come under Cus's custody. Okay, so you start training Mike Tyson at 12 years old, but then three years later, when he was 15, a situation happened 
with an 11 year old female relative of yours? It was closer to 16, but yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Tell me what happened. It doesn't just happen. He wakes up in a, on the wrong side of the bed. Things had been happening leading up to that. He had been thrown out of school. Uh, he had problems in school, you know, with kids and different things without getting into it all. But he was having problems. But he was going to be the next heavyweight champ. So there was ways around those problems. And Cuz found ways around them, with the principal, with whatever it had to be. And it was causing a problem for me because I trained them every day, not Cuz. And I'm in the gym every day with other kids, not just him. He's one of the many, but he's the main one because whatever. But I'm training everyone the same, teaching everyone the same. And, and I got rules for everyone. And if you break the rules, you get put out of the gym. He broke the rules, I put him out of the gym. You know, just to show him. Just to show him that, yeah, you, you, you're this, but you got to be this. You, you also got to be able to control yourself outside the ring. You also got to be able to, you know, be successful outside the ring. You also got to follow the figure rules outside the ring. And otherwise, there's, as, as you should know already, obviously, where we got you from, that otherwise there's, there's repercussions. And, and I felt as a teacher, Cus said, you're a great teacher. Well, I thought part of teaching was that. I thought part of teaching was that. That, that you can't complete the job unless you do the full job. And the full job was to try to make him a better person in those areas as well as a better fighter. Yeah, I'm teaching him to slip punches. Yeah, I'm teaching him to, you know, go to the body. Yeah, I'm teaching him to put combinations together. Yeah, I'm teaching him to keep his punches short. But along the line, I was also teaching him that you have to conduct yourself within the realm of everything, of, of outside the ring. And if you can't be strong outside the ring, it'll show up inside the ring. So I'm doing what, for me, it's easy. Because it's like ABC. It's simple. Go to the gym, teach him how to fight, and make sure that his mode of behavior is within a certain boundary because those are the rules. And it doesn't matter what he could be. It's what the rules are now to be that. Don't, and the rules for everyone. I was looking. I didn't have the pressure Cus had. Cus was older. He was getting older. He already had two champions. He had a heavyweight champ. The clock was ticking. For me, there was no clock. For me, it was just you do the job, and that's the only way to do it. But it was much harder for Cus. I didn't know it at the time but much harder. And he did something he never did in all those years we were together, me and Cus. We were partners. He went against me. He, he put Tyson back in the gym. And that's the worst signal you can send to someone who's the teacher and, and given hard love, right? And all of a sudden, he's the good guy. I'm the bad guy. And now Tyson's, he's from the streets. He's very, very smart in those ways, very instinctive. He's going to test those boundaries. And the next thing you know, he's um, testing those boundaries. And he's, he only knows one way, to test them. And he's with an 11-year-old girl who happens to be in my family. And... um I don't have to go into what he did or what he said and what he threatened to do and what he, it, it wasn't something that should be allowed. It, it's not allowable. And Well, I, I mean, from what I understand, Tyson at one point said he grabbed the girl's butt, basically. Yeah, but he said what he was going to do. And beyond that, I didn't, other time. And look, I'm not condoning what I did. But I knew what it was leading to if I didn't do something because he was going to do what he said. He would do what he said. I believed he would. 
I also believe that if I didn't stop him from doing what he did, I wouldn't be taking I wouldn't be protecting my family. And and um You could have the greatest fighters in the freaking world, be on TV seven days a week, make millions of dollars, have more cars than you need. But if you don't have your own dignity, and that starts with simple things like standing up for your family, and you, if you don't have your own, just your own dignity, um, you have nothing. And... There's, there's a lot of ways of violating someone. And there's a lot of ways of stealing from someone. There's a lot of ways from taking from someone. You could take their physicality, beat the crap out of them. You could, you could violate them that way. Or you could try to take the most important thing that somebody has, their self-worth, their dignity. And he understood that. And he thought he was going to take that. And... Nobody could take it. You could give it. I already knew that. But nobody could take it. You could give it, but you have to give it. And you have to understand when you give it what that means. And for me, it means you're already dead. It doesn't matter what happens to you physically after that because you're already effing dead. So, look, I, again, I don't control... I, I, but I went and did what I felt I needed to do. Under, and that's why I took the time to explain it. But it doesn't matter. I did it. I got a gun. I, I went and uh, I grabbed him outside the gym and told him that if you ever go near my family again, in any way of hurting my family or what you said you were going to do to to this person, um, I'll kill you. And um, I want him to be sure that he understood it, you know, because I understood him. I want to make sure he understood me because I understood what I, what I needed to, what he would do. But I need him to understand what I really would do because I didn't want to do it. Because I knew it would destroy, well, it would destroy my my family's life. It would destroy his life, obviously. And so I wanted to make it very clear. And then if it was going to be, it was going to be. But at least I made it very, that's how serious I understood that it was. So I said, do you understand me? And he, you know. He showed that he didn't, probably. So I shot a bullet off close to his ear just so he would. Because I didn't want to be in that position again. If, if I had to, I would. But I, I didn't want to. And in my way, I know this is whatever. It just sounds like words. But in my way, I was saving him and me. Well, I talked to Michael Jai White, uh, who played Mike Tyson in the HBO in the HBO movie uh, years ago, and he said he met up with you and talked to you about this uh, particular situation. And um, I guess in the movie there was like a scene where when you did that, he blew a kiss Tyson to me. Was, sorry, he blew a kiss to me or something, right? Well, well, no. What what he said what was this was I guess in the movie they showed that Tyson was kind of scared of the whole situation, but when Michael talked to you, what what you told him, according to him, was that Mike actually after that situation yeah, he smart. wasn't scared. He's smart. And he went he went back to Brooklyn and got a, a crew of his guys and was coming back to essentially kill you over the situation. Yeah, look, I don't know that. Nobody knows that. It didn't, I'm, but I am here. Let me, yeah, I'm still here. So okay. we know that. We know that. But I don't believe in talking about stuff. I, I believe that's why the only reason, it wasn't a, 
It wasn't a show, a, a TV thing. It wasn't a freaking uh, the book. It was to so. It was to make sure that he under, that I didn't have to do what I was gonna do, that I that I, I, I if he felt he had to do that, then you do it. But I'm grateful if that's true that it didn't happen. Okay, <laughs> that's a good thing. It's good yeah. for you. if you like this interview. It's good for you too, I guess. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's all freaking BS. All that matters is what what happened and what didn't happen. That's yeah. all that matters. And and you know what else matters? Where we got to. And I hope he's at a good place. I hope he's at a good place and it's and it's real. And I and look, he's more popular than ever. And mm -hmm. I and that's great. That's great. That is great. I mean, it's a phenomena, but it's great. And at the end of the day, he's got to live with himself for everything. I got to live with myself. I don't condone what happened. I'm thankful every day that I I didn't have to pull the trigger. I'm I'm thankful. I'm thankful for, to him. I'm thankful. And if he and if he was gonna was gonna really if that was real, thanks for not killing me. Thank you. I thank you. Well, because of this whole situation and the gun getting shot off, Cuss ended up siding with Tyson and essentially kicked you out. He didn't kick me out. I left. You left. Okay. And Fair listen, enough. I didn't see any choice. Um, eventually, he would have had to kick me out. But I wasn't going to embarrass myself that way. I, I, I left. I understood it to be what it was. I, I I actually, as good a man as my father was, in his own quiet way, he was the greatest teacher of all. Just by the way he lived his life, what he did, what he didn't do, I was an idiot. And I learned a lesson that prepared me for all of this. With it had nothing to do with the great things I learned from Cuss. I was running around fighting in the streets and I got hit with a tie iron. And I'm like 16 years old, whatever the hell I was. And I go down to his office. His office is what it is always. It's packed. I got to get stitched. And it's packed. It's five hours to see Dr. Atlas. You know, he takes care of everyone. You don't have to have money. And he's a great doctor. And there's people outside the door waiting to get in. My friend takes me down there, drives me down there. I'm bleeding like an idiot, like a pig. I got blood. My white T-shirt is red. I go walking in like I'm, like I'm Mick Jagger going on the stage. Like I think that I, I'm entitled because I'm his son that I'm going to go in there and get stitched up and go back to behaving the way I behave. Well, the nurse sees me, oh my God, takes me right in past all these people, right in, right into my father. My father takes one look at me and says, make a wait outside like everyone else. I wait outside for a few hours. Finally brings me in. Gets me ready. I wind up with 11 stitches. And um, as he's getting me ready, or she's getting me ready, the nurse, she's got the needle ready with Novocaine. And he looks at it, he says, what is that for? It's for the, you know, before you stitch them, doctor. He doesn't want that. If he's going to live a life like this, he wants to. Feel, he needs to feel the way he lives. He needs to feel the you know the way this kind of life will make you feel. He do, he doesn't want that. And of course, I was embarrassed. I said, "Of course, I don't want that. Of course, I don't want that. What are you freaking putting that there for?" And then she he hit me with all the stitches. I felt everyone didn't make a sound. The point I'm making is, I understood. 
that there is repercussions for your action. There is a price to pay for your action. I, 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 I got that part of it down already. I already understood that. So I understood what I did, what it meant, what I had to do. I couldn't be there no more. I understood. And so, but there was more to it, but it didn't have to be more. It didn't have, it's just like those guys didn't have to go and freaking turn state evidence to get me and put it all on me to get out from under so it wouldn't be on them. I wasn't going to freaking do that anyway. You didn't have to do that, you dopes. And Cuz didn't have to do anything. He thought he did. I wasn't, like I said, I was done. It was over. But Cuz had a problem. Tyson was a ward of the state still. He was going through the process of adopting him, which obviously made sense. And he was going to be this great fighter. Now there was a chance he wasn't going to have control of this great fighter because as a ward of the state, there was responsibility on our side, not just because me, our side, where he had to be brought up a certain way. He was out of school already. He already got kicked out of school. They didn't know about it. All they knew was he was winning tournaments. He won the Nationals for the second year in a row. We won the Junior Olympic Nationals in Denver, Colorado. Knocked everyone out. That's what they knew. They didn't know that there were problems in school with teachers, with kids, with students. They didn't understand. And the last thing that Cus needed them to know was that his trainer put a freaking gun to his head because he wouldn't be with Cus too long after that. So, right. so I got a knock on my door. I was getting ready to leave. I was living with my, my wife and we were uh, on Quarter Skill Road in an apartment. And um, I was getting ready to leave you know, in a short period of time. My wife was pregnant with our first beautiful child. And um, getting ready to go to New York and pick up with my life. And we got a knock from one of the guys that, a friend of mine, friend of Cus's from the gym. And, you know, he said, can I talk to you? Cus wants me to tell you something. And he gave me a deal. Offered me a deal. 5% of Tyson's earnings for the rest of his life or whatever, the rest of his career, if I would leave. I'm leaving anyway. And, you know, I still, I still had a little bit of growing to do, a little maturing to do. So I did the easy thing. I told him to shove it somewhere and to tell Cus to shove it somewhere because all I felt was betrayed. I didn't feel nothing else. I didn't feel like I lost money. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I felt like I got betrayed. That's all I felt. So I told him, get out of here. Freak it. I don't care about that. And the funny thing was, years later, when the story was a little tiny bit, a little tiny bit around, people said, oh, man, you stood up. You, you threw the money away. I didn't stand up to nothing. I stood up for myself for other reasons. It had not, I was never going to get that money. If you guys want to make me, uh, you know, Captain Courageous uh, and, and stand up because I walked away from money. I, what did I walk away from? I was never going to get that money. It was never real anyway. Not that I thought of it that way, but that, that never would have happened. But it didn't matter. Well, let, let me ask you a question. Uh, Customato was never married, never had any children. Uh, there great was man. a woman. He was a great man. Right. Well, he, there was a woman who was part of his operation, Camille but they Ewell. were not romantic. Camille Ewell. Camille right. Ewell. Exactly. There was always rumors that, that Cuss was possibly gay or something like that. Is that any truth to that? I don't know. None. When it comes to, as far as, as, far as I know, none. But okay. I can't control what people say, but none. He was a man's okay. man. 
He grew up in Brug Brugner Boulevard in Everlast, near Everlast factory. Me and him drove down there to get equipment all the time. He would drive me nuts before we could get to the warehouse to buy the equipment. He'd go by his old house. Teddy, that's where I grew up. Across the, I know, cuz. I've been here 452 times. I know, cuz. Across the street, Murderers Incorporated. They, they, they were there. Yep, that's right. That was his neighborhood. All right, cuz. I know nothing about any of that stuff. All I know is he was a great trainer. He was a great mentor. Um, and like everybody, he was human. He was human. And at the end, I think he got tested in those human ways where he wanted to have one more champion. And, yeah. and I, I feel if he wasn't at that point in his life where he was getting older and his whole life was boxing, he once told me, to your point, he said, Teddy, you know why I never got married? I never got married because it would have been unfair. So what do you mean? Because I never got married because it would have been unfair to a woman and to a child to marry them because my marriage was this, boxing. And I could never do, be a proper father or husband. So that's why I never got married. And when a man like that dedicates his whole life to what he dedicated and he starts getting to the horizon, he starts getting to the sunset, to the end, the only thing he's got left, what's he got left after all those years of giving everything to that one thing? The only thing he's got left is legacy, reputation, what he's going to, that's the only thing he's got left. The only, the only valuable thing that he has is what he leaves behind. And he wanted to leave behind the legacy of being a, the greatest trainer and having the greatest heavyweight champ of all time. And you know what? When he left, he did. After you left, in 1985, Custom Auto passes away. And then in 1986, Mike Tyson becomes the youngest heavyweight champion ever at age 20. Which is what which, Cus wanted. Which is, you know, which basically beat the previous record of Floyd Patterson, who became heavyweight champ at 21, I believe. Yeah. So Cus got the two youngest heavy. He's got the two youngest heavyweight champions of all time and arguably the most sensational one, whatever, but, or the town, one of the most talented ones ever could punch with either hand, quickness and speed combination, un, un, unmatched, unmatched in some ways. So, um, and ferocious and, and, and a meteor in sensation, uh, in, in, in promotional world, uh, you know, other than Muhammad Ali, better known than any other fighter. Though, though he had it all. He had everything. But he also got out before the other stuff could come. Before all the other stuff could come. Cuz got out before. In other words, Cuz had what he needed to die. And again, call me cold, whatever you want to figure, call me. I really could care less. But he could die now because you had to understand cuss. It was all about... It was all about greatness in boxing. It was all about having a great heavyweight champion. That, 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 was, that was what life was about. That, that, was, that was it. And he accomplished that. And he accomplished it without being touched. He, he left before all the stuff, other stuff that was always there. You know, as far as behavioral things and treatment of people, whatever, whatever you're putting, whatever. I don't have to say it. Well, Mike Tyson becomes heavyweight champ, and he becomes the most exciting heavyweight champ of that era. Not only does he keep the title for years, but he knocks people out in 30 seconds. And for people my age, he was basically the greatest of all time because, you know, I'm not old enough to really see, to have seen the, the Muhammad Ali era. And this kept going until 1990. Mike Tyson loses to Buster Douglas, the greatest upset in sports history of any sport. The, the odds, I think, were like 60 to 1. And I've interviewed uh, Tyson and Douglas about the situation. Um, when you saw this happen, were you surprised that Tyson lost? What, am I going to become the Monday morning freaking quarterback? 
Uh, really, you're making me a Monday night morning. I can say anything I want. I hope my reputation a little bit precedes me that, that what I say, I believe, and, and it matters. And it matters just like it mattered to cause the reputation he left. My reputation, it matters. It's more important than being right about a fight or not. I just felt, and I was documented in this, I just felt that the first time someone stands up to him, he's going to have a problem. That as strong as he was in areas that you just very beautifully described and laid out, as good as he was in those areas, as great as he was in those areas, he was just as weak in the areas of resolve, of finding a way when his talent wasn't enough, when his pure talent wasn't enough to find a way. The great ones find a way. Ali found a way. Joe Lewis found a way. The great ones find a way. Sugar Ray Robinson found a way. And... I just felt that that day would eventually come. I didn't know when. I didn't know when. I didn't know it would be in Tokyo with Buster Douglas, a guy who had given in on his own, who always had the talent to be a great fighter. Always, he was big. He was could punch. He was technically solid. He had all kinds of skill levels. He had a, he had everything. He had experience, but. He didn't have to resolve. He didn't have the character. He didn't have to. He was a dog. People in a bad way. People would say he's a dog. He'd never be a champ. He, he'd give in against Tony Tucker. He would give in. Well, he had the ability, but he didn't have the toughness. He, he, he didn't have the heart. The worst thing you could say about a fighter. But what they didn't understand was on that night, he had all of that for one night. I don't know if God's a sports fan or what or a boxing fan, but on that night, somebody made sure that Buster Douglas had everything, everything that previously people had thought he would have, that he never quite got there. He was missing that one thing. But on that night, everything came together to make sure that Buster Douglas had the one thing he never had to complete the picture of this promise of a fighter that never was realized, was never realized. And he got his second chance. He got redemption. Redemption is beautiful. Beautiful. This country loves redemption. It's part of why they love Tyson. And he got that at the price of his beloved mother dying. She died a month, a couple months earlier. He loved yeah. her. And you know what? A transition took place where the things that held him back, being afraid, not knowing how good he could be, being afraid to face the piper, being afraid to go to that extra place, go to that dark place when, when, it was, when you're hurt and when it's hard to go to that dark place, he wouldn't go to it. He would just stop. He wouldn't go there. His mother, the memory of his beloved mother, gave him a lantern to go and put light in a place he could never put light, to go to that place. Because... He couldn't be hurt by somebody named Mike Tyson at all compared to the way his loss of his mother hurt him. He couldn't be hurt that bad. Could not be hurt that bad. And on one night, he could be strong for his mother. And he did. And he was everything you want a fighter to be on that one night. Never again. <laughs> never before. Never after. Never. Yeah. But on that one night, he was great. And you know what? He could go to his grave. People could say whatever they want about him, but he could go to his grave knowing that on one night I was great. Were you great? Were you great? I was great. 
and he upset the, and you and he shocked the world, and he yes. did. He shocked the world, and that's why he shocked the world. And um, and in some ways, he said he exposed Tyson. He pulled the curtain back on the wizard to see what was really behind that curtain. A great, great, great talent. Explosive talent. Unbelievable talent. But something was missing. The, the engine, the engine that drives that beautiful talent, the engine, oh, the, the character, the soul, the core of a person, that that never caught up, never caught up to what his talent was. Never developed to the level his talent developed. Just just never did. Look, I have a saying. I used to say, it ain't a fight. Excuse my English, but my lack of a grammar. But it isn't a fight until there's something to overcome. Until then, it's an exhibition. It's an athletic venture. Yeah. It's a home run hitting contest. But when there's something to overcome, then it becomes a fight. There was something to overcome against Douglas. There was something to overcome against Holyfield. There was something to overcome. He, I don't have his record in front of me, but let's say he was 55 and 5. So I know it's in that neighborhood, right? A lot of knockouts. Whatever, you're going to get it. I get it. You're a genius. You know how to go on the thing there. I, I, I'm a caveman. I don't even know how to go on. I don't even know how to send an email. I don't even know how to go on the internet. But you're going to, what's his record? Uh, Tyson's record is uh, 55 50 wins, 44 by KO, six losses, and two no contests. Okay, you ready? Those six losses represent the only fights he had in his career. Call me a hater. <laughs> Go ahead. Call me sour grapes. Go ahead. Promise I'm not. I promise I'm not. But go ahead. But that, those six fights represent when he had to overcome something, when a fight became a fight, and he came up short. So was the job really complete with him? Yeah, the job of teaching him to slip punches and explode punches, all that, uh, that was completed. But was the rest of the job completed? Listen, it don't matter. He's a rich guy. He's loved. He's beloved. I hope we got to the right place. But you know what? The only one who knows is him. The only one who knows where he really is is him. And I hope he really is in that good place. Well... Tyson loses, and then he goes to prison for the rape charge. During this time, you've been training a lot of different boxers. But in 1993, you get approached to train Michael Moore, who at the time was undefeated and the number one contender in the heavyweight department. But people were saying that he's difficult to work with. He was moody. He was driving you know, trainers crazy. He didn't have good habits. So tell me why you started, started to, to train Michael Moore and where that led. I was asked to. I couldn't have started if I wasn't asked to. His manager, John Davimos, is a good man. Uh, he was a good man. He wanted the best for his fighter. There was problems. He had a great trainer in Emmanuel Stewart. Great, 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 great trainer. He had already been light heavyweight champ. Now he was moving up to heavyweight. And he's going to fight Evander Holyfield, the real deal. And he had been a problem child. He had been a problem where Emmanuel didn't want to train him no more, was having problems with him. Uh, they were going to get this shot with Holyfield. They didn't want to blow it. They had to get somebody. And But John was, I don't want to say smart enough because then I think he was smart enough. And and But I, because then it's like, oh, you're smart because you get me. So it's hard, it's hard to just say it that way. 
But I think the way John looked at it, he was smart enough to understand what Michael was and what he wasn't. He was a great puncher, great athlete, really good fighter. Technically, Emmanuel did his job. But he was also a kid that was fractured in certain areas, and he couldn't remain fractured in those areas to beat Holyfield. He was still a kid that was... There was a reason why he behaved this way. It wasn't just because it was his nature. It was because John was smart enough to see that, maybe not exactly, but along the lines that he behaved this way and was resident to... He, he was against training sometimes and and blowing up and walking out in training and not training properly. And all that stuff, getting himself in trouble, basically sabotaging himself John was smart enough to understand he needed someone beyond just to teach him how to throw a freaking jab from a southpaw position. He knew how to do that. That he wasn't psychotic. Some people thought maybe he's crazy, he's this, he's that. He's always blowing up. I think on some terms, John Davimos deserves all the credit. Because he's the one who made a decision as a manager to take a chance on a young trainer, me, and take a chance because what he thought that was wrong with Holy, with, Ty, with um, Mora was a lack of knowing that he could trust himself. How's that? Of knowing that he could depend on himself. Because when a fighter goes in the ring, the most important thing he's got to know when he goes into that place with a real top fighter, he's going to know he can depend on himself. And Mora wasn't sure of that. He knew he could punch. He knew if he hit you, he could get rid of you. A little bit like Tyson. But he wasn't sure beyond that. And he wasn't sure... He wasn't sure who he could count on besides him in that ring. And he wasn't sure he could count on himself. His father had abandoned him when he was a kid. Um, so he would test people. He would test people where he would walk out of training. And you know why? He wanted to see if you would walk out. He wanted to see if you would stay there. He wanted to see if you were strong enough to stay, if you believed. Like, he's, he's going to walk out. He's going to test you. Now you're going to say, oh, I'm leaving tomorrow. Friggin', don't train. I don't care. And you're going to go along with it or you're going to give in to it. He wanted a test to see. He had to be strong. He wanted a test if you were strong. Not in a way where you could take a punch, but in a way where you could take a risk. Where, where, where you could be, where you could take, you could deal with the threat of not making money with him. Of, of standing up to him and take the threat of not making money with him. And um, so Davin Mose took a chance on somebody he thought could get to this. The most important part, the mind. 75% of my business is the mental side. No matter how good you are physically, if you're not right mentally, it don't freaking matter. So, on April 22nd, 1994, Evander Holyfield versus Michael Moore. Michael Moore wins to become the world heavyweight champion. How did that feel to actually train the world heavyweight champion after being in it for so long and being so close to it with the whole Tyson situation, but, you know, having to leave. And now you're actually behind the world heavyweight champion in boxing. Cuz told me when I was a young trainer, I wasn't making money, so he had to feed me somehow. So he fed my ego. So he used to call me the young master. Young master! Because I'm in the gym all day long. Seven days a week training fighters. So he said, young master, you're going to train heavyweight champions. You're going to train heavyweight champions. And it just felt like... I never... I always felt like I was, that, was, that was supposed to be my destiny. I mean, training champions, period. But that, I always felt like... I don't know if because Cus said it or because I, I dedicated myself to what Cuz told me, and I believed him, and I trained fighters seven days a week up in Catskill. 
gave everything else up. I, I don't know. All I know is when that day came, it was like, yeah, it's here now because it was supposed to be here. Like, it finally got there. But it's like, yeah, this was supposed to be, you know, because always said this would be my destiny. And you and you actually got there. I was lucky enough to have a couple other heavyweight champs after that. I was very blessed and very fortunate, and I'm thankful for everything I've had. Um, but that one, that one was the first one. And it again, it took care of a lot of, you know, kind of like Michael Corleone in The Godfather. A lot of family business was taken care of. <laughs> a lot of family <laughs> business was taken care of that night. Right. Well, after that win, and he won the WBA, W, and IBF heavyweight championship titles, the next fight was George Foreman, which he ended up losing. Nightmare. Getting ready for that fight. The only way we could lose was by Naka. And... I talked about a word earlier. I said, redemption is a powerful word. It's a scary word. It's a powerful word. I know it firsthand. It's very powerful. Very powerful. And he had redemption on his side. George Foreman was a special man. Michael Moore was a special man. George Foreman got put into retirement by Muhammad Ali, really Jimmy Young, but Ali did it. And Ali broke down the monster that night in Zaire. He exposed the monster. He broke down this Herculean fighter that, that could knock down, you know, walls. And he broke him down. And he made him live with that. He retired. He had one more fight. He got beat by Jimmy Young. Then he retired for 10 years. And he went into the church. He went into, you know, God's work. And during those 10 years, he suffered privately. I know he did. He suffered privately what happened in Zaire. Because in some ways, maybe similar to Tyson, but I think he was stronger than Tyson in other ways, ultimately. But very similar and similar backgrounds, where they came from. But Foreman got exposed that night by Ali, that his power wasn't enough. What else you got, George? I don't got nothing else. And to a certain degree, and boxing has taught me life, because to a, we were on a fight. Boxing is life. And we all submit. We don't like to hear that word, quitting, submitting, whatever. But we all submit, it's just a matter of how much, what degree, and how much we can learn from it and don't do it no more. And George realized that he gave in in that ninth round. He gave in to a certain point. Yeah, he got hit a right hand. Yeah, he pirouetted around the ring and he fell. But he also realized that he gave in. He had to live with that. What a man. What a special spot. He's one of my favorite people in the world. He, I have more respect for that man than he ever know. He lived with that. He lived with that for 10 years. He had to do a real life exorcism to get rid of those ghosts. He had to, and he, and he came back. He came back to make money for his church, but he came back to exercise those ghosts. Don't let anyone fool you. He couldn't live it. He could not be whole. Big George could not be Big George if he didn't come back. And he came back 10 years. And he finally came, got to the title fight with Michael Mora. And he, he did the impossible. But it was possible. He won by 10th round Naga. We won every minute of every round. But you know what scared the crap out of me? When he came into that arena, I was scared for the whole camp. I trained him so seriously. I have no excuses. None. I failed. 
I, I trained that guy as good as I could train. And Michael trained as good as he could train. And, and he was ready to keep his title. And I, every day I said, there's one thing he's going to try to do. He's going he's gonna to he's gonna try to mesmerize you with the jab, make you feel like there's nothing to worry about. Make, and then all of a sudden, boom, put a right hand right behind it. You're never going to see it. That's the one thing we can't let happen. We can't. And that is the one thing that happened. And I failed because that one thing happened. And we worked not to make, but credit to George. And the thing that, to the whole camp, I, people say, you think he can win a fight? He ain't trying to win a fight. He's trying to win a life back. He's trying to win a freaking life back. Do you understand what it, and, and he's not trying to win a decision. He, he knows what he has to do. And when he came in that ring with the same trunks that he wore in Zaire, oh my God, I would never show it to my fighter because you can't. My heart dropped. And I said, oh my God. Because he's facing everything he had to face. He's facing a goal. He's ready for redemption. He's ready. And that's the one difference with him and Mike Tyson. And yeah, I'll say it. Call me a hater again. Come on. Come on. Go ahead. But that's the one thing. That's why he's greater. He's greater for me than Tyson. And Tyson's great. But he's greater. Because he could face that. Tyson could never, well, yeah. Tyson could never mean, face those shortcomings. And, and George faced it. And he freaking, he faced it. He got in that ring. And he exercised the ghost of Zaire that night, and he got down on his knees and he looked up and, <laughs> you know, he was he. And then he went and made two hundred million dollars for the grills, and and the rest is history. God bless him. George Foreman is a special man. I wish he would do more preaching. I wish he would do more talking to people to exercise their own ghost in life. I really wish he would. Well, well, yeah, I just interviewed uh, Evander Holyfield, and we talked about his fight against Foreman in 91, and he said that was the hardest he's ever been hit in his entire life. He said he got hit so hard that he went into the ring, and he went into the corner and asked if his teeth were still in his mouth. That's hard. And he said, and he said what did he hit me with? And, he, and they told him, overhand right. <laughs> exactly the, the punch you're talking about. Yeah. And and, yeah, and he also and what fight. what Holyfield also said was that what he wasn't ready for was uh, Foreman's sense of timing was like nothing he's ever experienced. He could just time punches like nobody else. As as big as he was, as old as he was, he still had this obscene level of timing and this unbelievable power. And he was no longer inhibited. The first George was inhibited by his own power. He relied only on that. To line you up, hit you, you go away. He wasn't, he wasn't prepared to be more than that. He didn't know that he needed to be more than that. He didn't understand one thing he learned in Zaire. And I talk about my book. He, the difference between the truths and the lies. And this is a lesson for what I talk about. When I say fighting is life, boxing is life for me at least. And it's a metaphor, a true metaphor for life in a way that what happens there happens in life. And George was in a position in that fight in Zaire where he no longer thought he was in control of his choices. Ali made him feel, the great Ali, made him feel like it wasn't his choice what was going to happen. It was Ali's choice. And that's a lie. That's a lie. You could be taken down that road of lies, but it was a lie because it's always your choice. It is always our choice. And for the kids out there listening to this, it's always your choice. Yeah, you awful stuff going on at home. Awful stuff going on in the neighborhood. Awful stuff going on in the world. Your world. Awful. 
So it's not your choice now, right? It's the world's choice. It's the event. It's the moment's choice. It's not your choice what you're going to do. You, you can do whatever you do because it's not your choice because of all these overwhelming things. A lie. It's still your choice. And do you, and do you make it not your choice? And George, to his credit, God bless him, to his credit, he learned that, that yeah, my, Ali conned me, talked me into thinking it was his choice of how I would behave. No, it was my choice. And you know what? Yeah. I'm never going to get conned into believing that again. It's always, I can lose, but it's always going to be my choice of how I act and behave when that moment comes. And that was what really allowed George Foreman to come back and have his second life because he did. He, mm -hmm. he had two lives. He had yep. the he had the pre he had the pre alley life. Yep. And the, the post alley and the fight. post alley yep. life. Life. Yep. Exactly. Well, in 1996, Tyson fought Holyfield for the first time, and this was like eight years in the making because Holyfield was the number one contender when he lost to Buster Douglas, and then Tyson went to prison, and so forth. He comes out. And like I said, I just interviewed Holyfield. And what he told me, he said, look, number one, he had all already sparred Tyson when he was like 22 years old. And he wasn't scared of Tyson. And he said that coming into this fight, people were like, oh, you know, be careful, this guy. He goes, I'm not going to run. I'm not going to run from this guy. And he did it. He came in and then he beat Tyson. And that really, you know, kind of lifted the veil of the Wizard of Oz. No, no, because, Doug, you know, the Buster Douglas, Douglas thing was a little... Douglas lived it, but we didn't believe it. You didn't believe it, exactly. We just thought it was a fluke. But then when Holyfield did it, it was like, okay, this went all the way, you know, there's no, th th there's no way around this. Tyson legitimately lost to Holyfield. And then seven months later, there was the rematch, and that's when all hell broke loose, and Tyson ended up biting off part of Holyfield's ear and then bit him twice. Were you surprised when this happened? Are you sitting down? Yeah, you are. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you something. And you could go Google it. Go to the New York Post to that date, the Monday after that fight. The great, great late, the late great Jack Newfield, one of the great writers of all times, great people of all time, wrote a story. I was I had a house party with Jack Newfield the day of that fight with my wife. And it was at his brownstone in, in the village. And he wanted me to stay to watch the fight. And I said, no, because when Tyson fought, it was a private thing for me. And I said, no, I don't want to be around. People asking me questions. I, I'll go home. I don't want to be around. So he had all kinds of people there. He had a... He had the deputy mayor, he had the police chief, he had, that was Jack Newfield. He used to have everybody. And before I left, they said, we can't let you leave without giving us a prediction. What's going to happen? Again, I wouldn't even tell you this if it wasn't in the New York Post because nobody would believe it. Not that I care, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put myself in that position to look like I'm, you know, I'm giving that kind of story and it doesn't sound meritable, it doesn't sound believable. When they asked me that, I said, huh. even when I say it now, it sounds fantastic. But I said, Tyson's gonna get disqualified. And they said, What did you just say? And Jack's a great writer, so that tweaked his interest. Jack said, Teddy, did you just say he's going to? I said, yeah. There's no other out. He goes, what do you mean there's no other out? I said, I know Tyson. And if I'm right about him, he got stood up against Douglas. He got stood up to against Holyfield the first time. He knows he's empty in the areas that he can't be empty to beat this man. Yeah, he can punch. He might hit him on the chin. Most likely he won't because Holyfield already showed he's got a great chin. But 
he knows that he doesn't have the one thing he needs to beat this man. He does, he's empty in one area. He's got power, he's got speed. But he, he does not have what it takes to beat this man. He doesn't have that core of true belief that when the moment comes, he's willing to get through that moment. He's willing to get through that moment. He's willing to go into that dark room with no light. Holy Phil to go in there and he'll find the light switch. But he is not willing to go into that dark room with no light and, and get trapped in that room because he has never been whole in an area, in the one area that's most important to be whole where you really, really, truly believe in yourself in that way, besides your power and your speed, but you believe in the core of who you are. You believe, he used to, you, you guys forget, when, when he was getting ready to fight different guys, like whether it was Lennox Lewis, whether it was this guy, whether it was that guy, he used to, he used to give phrases of intimidation, like, how dare you talk to me that way when you know I'll eat you, you know, when you know I'll kill you for it, or, or you know, you're going to die for that, or, or I'll eat your children, or I'll do this, I'll do that. It sounded like, like, it sounded like good stuff, you know, to throw up there, part of the legend, part of the promotion, all of that, but it was more than that. He was using other people's quotes. One of them was Lex Luthor from, from uh, Superman. One was someone. They, they were all, I, I realized it. I said, oh, my God. These are all, it's not, you know why? Because he didn't know who he was. He still didn't know if he could be that guy. He could punch like hell. He won titles. But he didn't know when. When it got past that, when it got into that place that eventually you get to, where it's more than talent, more than power, more than speed, more than intimidation, he didn't know what was there. He didn't have an identity. So he grabbed other people's identities that could scare the crap out of you because those were the identities he needed. But he didn't believe he could be what he needed to be. So when he was fighting a guy, that he knew that he couldn't, he couldn't run over physically. He couldn't intimidate. He needed to be that guy. He needed to be a guy that could depend on him. And there was no him. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. There was no him. So what did he say? He gave the tip off. He had an alibi. He said, I'm not fighting unless they change the referee because the referee allowed... As soon as he said that, bang! I said, oh my God. I think I know what he's doing. He's setting the stage. He's setting an alibi here. He knows he can't go in there with this guy. He's going to get exposed. He's going to get exposed because he's going to get to the point where he's going to have to have more than endurance physically. He's going to have to have character. And he didn't believe he really had that. He didn't know that he had that. He didn't know he had that. So he was going to get forced into that place. And he didn't want to be empty. He didn't want to be empty. And he didn't want to be exposed. So he set the stage. And I told the writers, they all called me up. They all call me from Vegas. Teddy, did you really say this? This is what you believe? I said, yeah, why? And I explained it the way I just said it. I said, the only way he could go into this fight, they said, but Teddy, it's a $30 million fight. I said, don't matter. It don't matter. 30 million or not 30 million. If he's going to die, what is $30 million? If he's going to die, not physically, but die, and being, ex and being exposed. What's 30 million? What's 30 million? He's got to find a way to get in there. And he has to, he just found it. He's a streetwise guy. He's, a, he's got innate intelligence. He always did. He always did. He knew how to adjust to his surroundings. Always did. Always did. Genius. And he's still doing it. He's a genius. 
God yep. bless him. He's a genius. But he knew he had to have a golden parachute. And I said that just like that. I said, he had to, so they said, what's his golden parachute? Well, if that moment comes, if you don't hit him on the chin and a guy don't disappear, and that moment comes where they're going down that same road, he needs an out. And his out is to get disqualified. And they said, oh my God, are you serious? I said, yeah. I can't see. I realize that's the only way he could justify going in the ring. That he could get the gumption, whatever you want to call it, to go. He's got to have a backup. He's got to, he knows, he knows where he's empty. And he's got to have a gun hidden somewhere if he's going to go into this meeting. He has to. Otherwise, he knows he ain't coming out of this meeting alive. And that's his gun. That's his golden parachute. And so they said, well, what's he going to do? And I actually said, well, there's only a certain amount of fouls that you could commit, right? You can headbutt the guy. You could pick him up and throw him out of the ring. Or you could bite him. Or, or hit him below the belt a bunch of times. Well, there's you can hit him that. below the belt until they finally stop. That's yeah. too obvious. Hmm. Because if you bite him and you're a street guy and you have that rep, and you have that street creed, and you're Mike Tyson, you beat him because you're an animal. And that's okay. That's, that's acceptable. That lives the, that keeps the legend going. That's accept, I know it's not acceptable, I get it. But it, it's acceptable in that way. Because that keeps, that, that, that stays in, that stays in line with being the baddest man on the planet. That stays in line with being a bad mother. You know what? That he he is a mean son of a gun. You mess with him, he bit that guy's ear off. No, no, he bit the guy's ear off to get out. He yeah, actually he was, he was he was losing, and I've I've seen he interviews bit with the both, guy's ear off you know, to get with out. Holyfield and Tyson together, and Holyfield, you know, was winning, and Tyson admitted right there to Holyfield. He said, "No, I was losing that fight. He wasn't even trying to." If you him. need if you need further proof in a court of room, that's Exhibit A. Exhibit B, the referee was ready to, to disqualify, which he should have probably, but he forgot who was he was in the ring with. Holyfield, the real deal. Actually, the real yeah. deal. And when he said, I'm going disqu to disqualify him, Mills Lane, a great referee, God bless him, he's mm -hmm. gone now, but he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disqualify him. Holyfield, the man that he is, forget about the fighter, the core I talk about, having it, he says to him, you're not stopping. Now. His corner said, I'm going to stop. His corner, Don Turner, who's a great man, he said, I'm going to stop this. He said, you're stopping nothing. Put yeah, the no, mouth. He kept going after the first the bite. It was only after in, the second bite where Mills Lane just said, okay, it's over. Put the mouthpiece in my mouth. I'm going to go and knock this freaking guy out. And then what happens? If, if it was really, really about something else, that would have been the end of it. But he didn't complete his task. He didn't complete his job. The guy was still there. He was yeah. The fight was supposed to be over. Tyson yeah. didn't bargain on that. So what did he have to do? He had to bite him again. Yeah, exactly. And at that point, the fight was over. It was disqualified. Um, and that really completely solidified Holyfield in the place that he was. And after that, Tyson had some more fights over the years, but essentially the reign of Tyson was over with those two fights. Now, uh, my final question to you. In 2013, for the first time, you actually spoke to Tyson face-to-face. -face. It was at a boxing event at a Turning Stone Casino. How did that conversation go? Unexpectedly, unbeknownst to me, um, I was calling the fights on ESPN, which I did for 20 some years. And I'm ringside corner fights in the middle of corner fight. And my producer gets in my headset and said, Mike Tyson's coming up to, uh, really? 
Mike Tyson's coming up. He wants to apologize. And, you know, I'd rather have been private. It's in front of millions of people. It's on TV. That's a private thing, but what are you going to do? Get up. You're going to accept his handshake or not? Yeah, I accepted it. I accepted that it was sincere. We shook hands. He hugged me. He told me he loved me. I appreciated it. He said he was sorry. I appreciated it. What, what, what did he say he was sorry for exactly? Nothing. Or did he just say, I'm just sorry? Said I'm just sorry. said, I'm sorry. That was enough. He didn't have to say anything else. Okay. And we hugged. He said he loved me. And um, he's a very affectionate guy at times. And he is. And he's a very soft guy at times. And he's a very needy guy at times, as we all are. Um, needy of, of acceptance. Needy of love. Of, you know, needy of, uh, you know, needy sometimes of forgiveness. And he was going through a time in his life, I found out, I realized, through the 12 steps of alcohol, drug, we have where, yeah, those 12 steps. And God bless him for doing it. Good for him. Where you have to be a tough guy to face that. And he was going through those 12 steps where you have to account for your mistakes. You have to, you know, go to people that you did wrong in your life. And you have to, you know, you have to set the you have to set the book straight so you can move on with your life. So you can forgive yourself. I guess that's the theory of it. Um, I don't know. I don't know how deep and meritful and since, I don't know. Because since then there's been some things that have made me wonder. But I know that night I accepted it. I was grateful for it. I was. And, and people ask me now. And it's fair. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. It's fair. They ask me, do you, can you forgive? And you know, I can. For two reasons. But one, there's a condition to it. A little bit. And there shouldn't be. I understand. But the truth is the truth. For me, I can't, but... It would be on the terms, or at least hopefully on the terms, that he was sincere. And I don't know if he was. And, and that would be important to me, that he was sincere. And I don't know. And I hope he was. But at the end of the day, yeah, because I did wrong too. And I'm still working on forgiving myself. So if, I, if, if I'm having... If I'm still having a, a work in process of forgiving myself for a lot of things I did wrong in life, I'll be damned if I can't forgive someone else. So I hope that, um, I hope we're both in, uh, I, I know I'm in a place where I'm grateful to be in. Four grandchildren, two children, a great wife, a, a a career that has blessed me, um, opportunities to talk to, I get asked to go to, to you know, talk to NFL teams, NBA team, collegiate teams, to go to, I try to do whatever I can. I get asked to go to prisons to talk, and, and the word that I bring is redemption. Redemption. Powerful thing. Can, can, can correct a lot of, it can change lives uh, like magic. But, and I'm grateful for all of that. I'm, I'm grateful that, um, I'm grateful I finally, I survived all my mistakes and selfish moments and was allowed to get to a good place. I'm grateful for that. And like I said, I, as far as Tyson goes, I, you know, I have to forgive myself too. I know I did something that uh, there's no condoning. Even though what he did, there's still no condoning, you know. And I I don't apologize for it. I made that clear. And if I, you know, but 
Uh, and I hope I'm never in that position again. But uh, because I believe in what I believe in. That there is no life without dignity. None. None. But I, you know, I, I hope he can truly forgive me. And I don't know if he can. And But uh, at the end of the day, he, he apologized for what he did. And um, again, I, I hope it was as meritful as I would wish it to be. Um, and I would hope that mine would be as meritable too uh, as I would, I would intend it to be. So, uh, Teddy Atlas, appreciate you coming in and telling your story. Um, spans many decades with legendary fighters. Uh, and there was a lot of times that you could have been counted out, which you didn't. To persevere and to have this type of career, to have heavyweight championships that you contributed to, um, to still going strong, to still being a powerful voice in boxing. Um, truly appreciate you coming in, and I know you have a lot more ahead of you. I hope so. I hope so, and um, I hope, you know, I hope I can, I, and again, this is almost a blasphemous statement because who should say such things, but I hope I could make part of the world just a tiny bit better, if not just for my family, myself, but for some people that can learn something from some of the mistakes that I made and some of the admissions that I've made of why I made those mistakes. You know, we, we have a charity foundation that's been around 27 years that is helping families that fall through the cracks that have nowhere else to go. You know, whether it's a single, a lot of single moms, no fathers. We go into the inner city places where there's big, big needs. And we go in there and it could be a single mom that has a, just recently that had a severely autistic child. And she, uh, she was working two jobs, doing her best. A couple of the kids got sick. They, uh, she fell behind rent. She got evicted. She got put into a city shelter. And it's a violent place. Her autistic child lost it because the environment changed. And she had nowhere to go. And they came to us, and we got them an apartment. And again, we're not the great, great, but we get them from point A to point B. We, we get in an apartment, and then she gets back to working. She, she's able to take care of things herself. And she was able to bypass being in that that shelter where it could have ruined her daughter's life and things like that, whatever it is. And we're fortunate. We go into the at-risk neighborhoods and schools, Title I schools. In New York City, it's called, it means a, a Title I school is identified as a family making less than 35000 a year. So we go in there, a lot of problems, no fathers for the most part, and we go in there and we tell them, if you improve your behavior, if you start caring about who you are, you don't have to get an A or B, but if you just take ownership over who you are, how you behave every day, caring about that, we'll come back and drop off 200 tickets to a Yankee game, Mets game, Knicks game, you know, Nets game, and over the next month, your teachers will put you on a list if you earn the right to be on that list, and we'll supply the buses you'll go. And it makes a difference. You know why? Because somebody cares that all of a sudden somebody's given them a reason to care about themselves. And we're able to do that and do a lot of other things where we help people with their medical costs that don't have the proper insurance. And we do it every day of the year. Uh, the final thing I say is we also go into these neighborhoods with a mobile unit, a mobile van, a mental health unit with, with these neighborhoods where 10 year old kids are committing suicide. We just started a scholarship for a 10-year-old child that committed suicide. You know why? Bullying. Bullying. And you know why this, this poor kid was bullied? Because he excelled. I'll say it again. He excelled. So people said, oh, you're better than us, huh? Oh, you're better than us. And they stayed on him, stayed on him, and he hung himself. So we start scholarships in this kid's name, but we also go into these neighborhoods with mentors, with psychiatrists, with psychologists, with anti-suicide, with anti-bullying. 
and we go in there, we we try in a little way of making a difference. Anyway, uh, thank you for listening, letting your ears bleed, and um, I'm a good cut man. If you need me to stop the bleeding, I'll be right over. <laughs> That's what it is. Teddy Atlas, appreciate everything. Until next time, peace.